Well, you can join me in opening your Bibles to Leviticus chapter 16. And that's on page 95 in the Bibles that are under the seats nearby you. So if you don't have a Bible, please grab one of those and join us in Leviticus 16. And uh, that song really does express what we're expecting in this time together every week. We're expecting this to be a time where we hear God Himself speak to us through His Word. So we believe that the Bible is God's very Word to us. It's His voice. And so we take this time to understand His Word so we can hear Him clearly. And we expect that God's, God will transform us through His Word and renew our minds. And so every time we come to the Bible, we're hearing God speak the Holy Spirit's at work, and we want Him to reveal Himself, and He reveals Himself most clearly in Jesus. So that's why this is a time not just for Bible explanation, but for beholding the beauty of Jesus. Because as we behold His glory, we're transformed to become like Him. So let's pray that He'd do that. Father, we thank You for Your Word, and we thank You that we can gather with such great expectation that we're not looking at dead letters on a page, but we are hearing Your voice by the Spirit. And so we pray that You would open our hearts, our minds, the, give us the sight from our heart to behold Jesus so that we'd be filled with awe and gratitude and thankfulness, and we'd become like Him. Pray this in Jesus' name and by the Spirit. Amen. Well, we're continuing in our series on Leviticus, and I've, I've heard often as I've just been studying this book the past few months that many people have never heard a sermon on Leviticus. So if you've been with us, I think this is number nine or so, although we've, we've done some before in the past um, years ago. So we're coming now to chapter 16, and this is the Day of Atonement, so often referred to as Yom Kippur. This is the central event in Israel's calendar year. Israel would observe this every year. It's at the very center of their life together. And this chapter describes it and plants it at the very center of the book of Leviticus. So Moses crafted this book with great intentionality, and he put this at the literary center. So the book of Leviticus is like a mountain. You can picture it like a mountain, and chapter 16 is the peak. And it's not just the center of Leviticus, it's the center of the first five books of the Bible. So we call the first five books the Pentateuch or Torah or Law. So I won't go into all the details this morning, but it's clear that Leviticus is not just, you know, the third out of five, but it's to be viewed as the center of the first five books of the Bible and that chapter 16 of Leviticus is the center not only of Leviticus, but of the Torah, of the Law. So the Day of Atonement, this central day in the life of Israel is literally placed at the center of the law. So why is it so important? Because Leviticus is about drawing near to God and remaining with God, and everything in the book of Leviticus is building up toward this day of atonement. It's this yearly day of spiritual cleansing and renewal. And this is ultimately a drama, as we're seeing throughout this series, of how we get back the life we lost in Eden. After humanity sinned and was sent out of the garden, the question is, how will we get back? How can sinners dwell again with God? How can we live the life that we were always meant to live, enjoying His presence, reflecting His rule? And so the Day of Atonement shows what we need. The Day of Atonement deals with our sin so that we can dwell with God. And this is all here to teach us how Jesus provides a way back to God. So it's not that Leviticus was this primitive setup in the past, and then things evolved in modern people, even 2,000 years ago. By then, it was kind of old and archaic, and so God changed His plan and brought Jesus instead. Or that He, you know, Leviticus was the first trial run, and then over time, God thought, you know, how can I find a creative way to bring these things to a culmination? Oh, Jesus, we'll have Him do it. No, instead, Jesus is the point of history. And God planned Leviticus to be a foreshadowing, a teaching tool, so that when Jesus would come, we would understand Him and understand the significance of the cross. So if you want to understand Jesus, you actually can go back and read Leviticus. Le Jesus helps us understand Leviticus. Leviticus helps us understand Jesus and therefore how our sin is dealt with 
so that we can dwell with God. So that's what this teaches it. So here's it teaches us. So here's what we'll do. We'll see the drama of this day. So let's walk through this story and see the drama of this day. And then we'll see how this echoes Eden and points to Jesus. And we'll read the text as we go. So this is about a drama of how God deals with our sin so that we can dwell with God. And ultimately, it teaches us about Jesus. So first, the drama of the day. This chapter walks through the Day of Atonement, so we'll see it unfold in four steps. We see the need, the priest, the goats, and the institution. So first, the need. Uh, God's presence is now with Israel in the tabernacle, but this is dangerous because God is holy and the people are not. So look at verse 1. It reminds us of a tragic moment that had just happened. The Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron when they drew near before the Lord and died. So those two sons were Nadab and Abihu. They were priests, and they disobeyed God inside the tabernacle, and so God struck them down with fire immediately. Leviticus 10 told that story. We looked at that a few weeks ago, and the instructions for this day of atonement happen right after that event. So there's been some instruction in between chapter 10 and 16, but we're to realize that the narrative's actually picking up right where we left off in chapter 10. And so this is reminding us that drawing near to God can be dangerous. We were made to be with God, but we are sinners. And the threat of what happened to Nadab and Abihu is present. It's a present danger. And so the Day of Atonement is here to show God giving grace to sinners. This is God's instruction for how to deal with sin so that He can remain with them. But what about all the other offerings that we've seen in this series so far? So if you've been tracking with us, we've seen a number of offerings that deal with sin. Aren't they enough? Isn't it enough for Israelites as they sin to bring sacrifices for cleansing and renewal of their relationship with the Lord throughout the year? So why would they need a yearly day of atonement? Well, you can think of it like spring cleaning. So, you clean your house or your room throughout a year. You pick up messes, sometimes do little deep cleans, but still over the course of a year, things build up, and you need to have a reset, a deep cleaning that cleans everything you've missed and all the things that have built up, or cleaning a garage once a year, the same thing. You may pick it up and keep it relatively clean. You clean up messes, but then once a year, it needs a complete reset. So, that's really what's going on here. That's how the Day of Atonement worked. Israelites would give offerings and sacrifices throughout the year, but their sin would still build up. Not everything is covered, but God's house is then viewed as polluted with their sin, and the threat of death is real and lingering. The threat of God's departure from them because of the pollution and contamination of their sin is a real threat. But then each year, the Day of Atonement would provide a reset. So that's the need. Second, the priest. This is the day when the high priest alone would do the work. We see his preparation of washing and clothing and getting animals ready here and dealing with his own sin. It's verses 2 to 4. And the Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron your brother not to come at any time into the holy place inside the veil, right, because he'll die before the mercy seat that's on the ark so that he may not die. For I will appear in the cloud over the mercy seat. But in this way, Aaron shall come into the holy place with a bull from the herd for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. He shall put on the holy linen coat and shall have the linen undergarment on his body. And he shall tie the linen sash around his waist and wear the linen turban. These are the holy garments. He shall bathe his body in water and then put them on. So he gets the animals that he'll need for his own sin, he washes himself, and then he clothes himself with the priestly garments. But the clothes seem different than usual here. It seems like he's not wearing the complete, typical priestly uniform with all the scarlet and blue and gold. This seems to be a humbler kind of dress than usual, perhaps more like what's fitting to be a servant in the presence of the Lord. Then the priest makes a sacrifice for his own sins. He brings a bull to sacrifice for himself and for the other priests. So this is a sin offering, which can also be called a purification offering. So this offering was used to purify or cleanse the tabernacle 
from the stain of sin. So again, sins are viewed as this pollutant that stains the tabernacle. And since the tabernacle is this mini Eden or mini earth here, it's a picture of how our sins pollute the world. And since God dwells in the tabernacle, they pollute the place of His presence. And so, the priest cleans the tabernacle from the stain of their own sins. This process is in verse 12 to 14. And he shall take a censer full of coals of fire from the altar before the Lord, and two handfuls of sweet incense beaten small, and he shall bring it inside the veil and put the incense on the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of incense may cover the mercy seat that's over the testimony, so that he does not die. And he shall take some of the blood of the bull and sprinkle it with his finger on the front of the mercy seat on the east side. And in front of the mercy seat, he shall sprinkle some of the blood with his finger seven times. So he took coals from the altar and put it in this censer and brought them into the most holy place. And then he put incense on the coals so that smoke would fill this central room in the tabernacle, the most holy place. The smoke was probably created for a number of reasons. It was to keep distance between God and Aaron so Aaron couldn't see his glory clearly, keep him alive. It also created or was almost a recreation of the scene at the top of Mount Sinai. So remember Mount Sinai, this mountain, and there's a cloud of God's presence above there, and Moses would enter into this. The tabernacle is, is recreating. It's like a horizontal uh, picture of Mount Sinai, and entering into the tabernacle is like climbing the mountain and entering into the cloud of God's presence. It may even be a way of creating a cloud like the sky to picture God's presence in the heavens. So Aaron, the high priest, is portrayed as entering into God's heavenly presence here. And then he took a bowl of the blood for this, of the sin offering, and he sprinkled it on the mercy seat. So the mercy seat is the lid on the Ark of the Covenant in that most holy place where God's law was placed inside that ark, and he's cleansing it. So this room is viewed as God's throne room, and the ark is viewed as his footstool, and you have this mercy seat here, the cover, and he's sprinkling it to cleanse it from the stain of sin. So that's the priest dealing with his own sin and preparing for this day. And now the third step in the drama is the goats. This is the heart of the day. This is now the atonement for the people's sins, and this is done with two goats. And the goats are functioning as kind of a single, single sin offering for the people. And they're each doing something different. One goat dies, and the other goat is sent away into the wilderness. Now, why two goats? Well, remember, this whole day is ultimately pointing forward to Jesus, as we'll see. Jesus' work of atonement is far more complex than any single offering of an animal can portray. And so these two goats picture two aspects of what it means to have sin atoned. So, the picture is of two aspects of a singular atonement here, and the first goat pictures the aspect of cleansing. So, it functions just like the sin offering the priest just did. It cleanses the people, cleanses the tabernacle, and so Aaron cleanses the tabernacle with the first goat's blood. This is in verses 15 to 19. We won't, won't read that whole part, but here's what he does. He goes into the tabernacle, he starts in the holiest room, and he cleanses the most holy place. And then he goes to the holy place and cleanses the whole tabernacle in that sense. And then he goes out into the courtyard and cleanses the bronze offering or altar where the offerings are made there. And so he's cleansing the tabernacle in the reverse order at which it's polluted. Right? Sin enters in there and goes to the deepest place and he starts in the deepest place and it's viewed as like cleansing the, the sin out of the whole place. So the sins of the people have piled up over the year God's communicating that their sins affect more than themselves. They're like a pollution. And the house of God here, it's like a house that's been smoked in for decades. And there's just a smell and a yellowing that's happened. And so this is a cleansing and a reset of God's tabernacle for His presence to remain with them. So that's the first goat, pictures cleansing. The second goat pictures removal. It pictures the complete removal of the sins. So the first goat died in the place of the people, and the blood is used to cleanse, the second goat is alive. Here's what happens to it, verses 21 to 22. And Aaron shall lay both of his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it 
all the iniquities of the people of Israel and all their transgressions and all their sins. You see every, all these words used for sin piling up here. There's nothing missed. He's confessing it over the goat, and he shall put them on the head of the goat and send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a man who is in readiness. The goat shall bear all their iniquities on itself to a remote area, and he shall let the goat go free in the wilderness. The symbolism's pretty clear, isn't it? This isn't hard to understand. The high priest represents the people of Israel, and he's pictured as transferring the sins of the people onto that animal, as if every, if every individualite, every, every individual Israelite takes their own sin and is confessing it and letting it go, and it's being put onto this goat. And so the priest is doing that on behalf of the people, and all those sins get piled up like a load on that goat. It's put on the head of this goat, and then the goat is carrying away the people's sins. It's sent out away from the tabernacle into the wilderness. Now, earlier in the chapter, it said that this goat, the first goat was for the Lord, and this goat is for Azazel. So, that's not a translation. It's just how to say the Hebrew word, and whenever you see that in the Bible, sometimes it's because it's someone's name. Other times, it's because we don't know how to translate that word, and that seems to be the case here. It's hard to translate. What's Azazel? Uh, We don't really know. Some think it refers to a demon or Satan, so to picture sins returning to the source of temptation. Some say the word means something like rugged place, or it could be translated something like scapegoat, right? A goat of escape. We don't really know, but the symbolism is clear either way. The sins are being carried away out into the wilderness. They're being removed from God's presence, removed from the people, and they'll never return. It's probably why you have a man there walking the goat away. You don't want that goat coming back. So lead it away, let it go. So the tabernacle's cleansed, the people's sins are removed. It's a complete reset. And then the last part of the chapter establishes this as an institution. So this is not a one time event, it happens in the seventh month every year. And this is viewed as a Sabbath day of rest. So they aren't to do any work. Why? Because this is a day when God does the work for them. The people don't do anything for Him. They've done enough for Him and it hasn't worked out. That's the problem. They don't prove now that they can do better next year. They don't hurry and do a bunch of religious rituals and things to make Him happy. God says, no, you rest and I'll work for you. You just bring your need, you bring your sins, and this goat will die in your place for cleansing, and the other one will carry them away, and this will happen every year. Do you you see, this is God's idea, right? They didn't think this up. God Himself is portraying Jesus ahead of time to show that He's a God who wants to be near even sinners. This is all His idea of how to deal with sin. It's not like God's begrudgingly there, and then they're finding a a way to negotiate with them. Tell you what, we'll get a couple goats. I've got an idea. Um, No, this is God symbolically portraying ahead of time how their sin is going to be removed through Jesus because God wants to be with them. So, this is the drama of the day, and this drama makes the most sense when we see that it's drawing on and echoing the story of creation, the story of Eden. So, second, echoing Eden. So, we're seeing in this series that the tabernacle is this miniature, symbol-laden, Eden-like new creation. It's a new creation planted in the midst of this old, broken, fallen world, in the midst of Israel, in a tent. So, God's presence is once again like humanity. Heaven and earth are meeting again like Eden. And remember what happened in Eden. Humanity rejected God, and they fell under judgment. And what was the judgment? Well, there's two aspects that stand out in the creation and fall story. The first is death. God had said to Adam that he should not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He said, in the day that you eat it, you will surely die. And they did. From that point on, humanity is spiritually dead, separated from God, and headed toward physical death. So, 
Death is what everyone has to look forward to now because we are sinners. And the second aspect of their judgment was banishment. They were sent out of Eden to the east, to the wilderness. And in Genesis, as people keep distancing themselves from God or sinning against God, they keep moving further east away from God's presence. So what's going on with these goats? Well, these goats are symbolically taking that judgment. These goats are symbol-laden substitutes. The first goat takes the judgment of death. So you can picture this high priest in Israel kind of like a new humanity, a new Adam, just outside the gate of Eden, right, this tabernacle presence of God. How are we going to get back in? How will we dwell with God? How will we make this right? And then this first goat dies. Goat didn't do anything wrong. We did, right? The people did. But the goat takes their judgment. So how are they going to live is the question. How will God remain with them? The first goat dies in their place. You could say that this is penal substitutionary atonement. To give the the theological picture here, the goat takes their penalty as a substitute and makes atonement. The stain of sin is wiped away from the tabernacle so God can remain with them and they can remain with God. And then the second goat takes the judgment of banishment. So it's picturing the removal of their sins far away, but it also probably pictures the judgment of banishment from God's presence. The goat is sent away from God's presence to the east, just like Adam and Eve. It was sent into the wilderness, into the desert, If the tabernacle is the new realm of life, the the goat is sent as far away as possible into the realm of death, away from God's presence. The goat is taking the banishment that humanity deserves. And this is why the priest is able to go in one time a year, once each year. He washes himself, he clothes himself in the priestly garments, and he walks through those cherubim curtains. Remember the cherubim put outside of Eden to guard the way back. And this priest goes through those curtains, and the flaming sword doesn't strike him dead. And he goes in to God's presence, to the new symbolic Eden, into God's presence. He can do this because of the goats. The death has been taken for the people. The sins have been removed. They have a substitutionary death and banishment happen for them so they don't have to die immediately and be banished from God's presence. And now this high priest representing the people can re-enter God's presence without dying. He's the closest to God's presence that has happened since Eden here. Every year, Israel could watch this drama unfold. It's a beautiful picture portraying how the life that we all lost in Eden is being regained. But it's only temporary and it's only partial God's presence really was among them, and the high priest really did enter into God's presence, but this is not yet the new creation. This is partial, temporary. It's a symbol-laden drama. It was created so that, it, so that hope could be cultivated and longing for the fullness of life to come. By doing this year after year, Israel is watching this drama happen, and they're being taught to long for the real, true final and full restoration. Would God dwell with them as He did in Eden is the question they should be asking. Could we have not just a yearly cleansing, but a final cleansing? Could we have a removal of our sins as far as the east is from the west? Can we all dwell with God, not just the high priest once a year, no doubt entering with trepidation, Can we be at ease with God? And could this be not just for the Jewish people, but for people from every nation? In other words, will there be a day of atonement to end all days of atonement? There is. We call it Good Friday. So third, pointing to Jesus. This whole thing was set up on purpose by the Lord to show His grace that He would give through Jesus. It was a foreshadowing. The high priest 
needed to atone for his own sins, but Jesus was without sin. He did not need to bring any atonement for himself. The high priest needed to repeat this year after year after year. And that's nothing to say of all the other sacrifices that are happening every day through the year. And Jesus offers a sacrifice once for all. The high priest could only enter this symbol-laden presence of God and once a year in this earthly presence, but Jesus entered the heavenly dwelling of God so that he can bring the heavenly dwelling of God to the earth and renew the world to be a world, a new creation filled with God's glory and presence and his people without the threat of death. The priest secured the ability for God to continue dwelling among them in the tabernacle, but Jesus cleanses us so that he can send his spirit to dwell with us as his new tabernacle and his presence. So Jesus fulfills the symbolism that of both goats in himself, right? He died as a substitute, and the cross is Jesus fulfilling the picture of that first goat taking death for us and then bringing cleansing, and then also the second goat being banished from God's presence so that we don't have to be, and carrying our sins away, so they're removed as far as the east is from the west. Israel looked forward to their day of atonement every year, and now we in Christ look backward to ours because it doesn't need to be repeated. You know, the book of Hebrews draws all this together in chapters 9 and 10, so if you can, just flip over there to Hebrews 9 and 10, and we'll just read some of this section together before we end. So, Hebrews chapter 9 first. So, the book of Hebrews is reflecting in large part on Leviticus, especially this section of Hebrews, and especially it's reflecting on the Day of Atonement, and it shows how it was always meant to point forward to Jesus. So, Hebrews chapter 9, let's read a few sections together, verses 11 to 12. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, so into God's heavenly dwelling place. And he entered not by means of the blood of goats and calves, right? Thinking of the Day of Atonement that we just considered, but by means of his own blood. And what's the result? Thus securing an eternal redemption. So, we saw the first goat was not just a substitutionary death. It was also a way that the tabernacle was cleansed. So, the priest took the blood and sprinkled it into the tabernacle to cleanse it from the stain of sin. Hebrews is showing that the tabernacle was a copy of God's heavenly presence, and God's heavenly dwelling also needed to be cleansed in order for us to draw near to Him. And so, Jesus' offering did that. The work of Christ wasn't just Um, atoning on the cross, but also what that secured with this cleansing. So, Hebrews 9 verse 23 and on to 26 says this, thus it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites, but the heavenly things themselves can be purified with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. So, he's this priest representing us. Verse 25, nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters into the holy places every year with blood not his own, for then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So, how do we respond to all of this? Well, let's just respond to how Hebrews, this book, directs us to respond. There's three main implications of all of this, and it's that we draw near, that we hold fast, and that we encourage one another. And those three are in Hebrews 10. So, the discussion keeps going all the way through chapter 9 and into chapter 10, and then we come to verses 22 to 24. So, first, since Jesus has made the way back to God, He's restored what we lost in Eden, we draw near. This is verse 22. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts 
sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. If you're not yet a Christian, and maybe you're wondering, what would it mean to become a Christian? Why is Jesus so important? Why is He important to so many people? Why has He been so important to world history? If you're wondering what it would mean to become a Christian, this is it, and this is available to you. God made you, and you, like me, and everyone in this room, have rejected Him, and you've sinned against Him. You've done things you shouldn't. You've not done the things you should. You've not loved Him above all things. You've put other things in His place, and because of that, you and I deserve death eternally and banishment from His presence eternally. And here we see that there's a substitute, Jesus, who took our death and He took our banishment so that we don't have to have eternal death and banishment and judgment forever. And so He'll carry your sins away. That's what He's doing on the cross. And so this is an invitation to you and a call to you to let Him. Let Jesus take your sins away so that you don't have to have them loaded on yourself. Um, Leviticus 16 in Jesus will become relevant to every one of us. If it feels irrelevant now, the book of Hebrews says, after death comes judgment. We will be brought face to face with God, and we will either be having our sins weighing us down, and therefore we have to suffer the death and banishment from God's presence forever. That day is coming. Or we let Jesus in mercy and grace, and He's happy to do it. He's done it on the cross. You let Him take your sins as far as the east is from the west so that you can stand before the Lord and say, I don't deserve to be here, but Jesus died for me. The goat thing, He did it. He did that on the cross for me. And you'll be let in, not only to God's heavenly presence then upon death, but then you'll still actually look forward to the day when Jesus will return and renew the world, resurrect our bodies to sin no more, with no fear of death, with full confidence to draw near forever. So if you've never just prayed to the Lord and asked Him to do that, you can do that right now, later today, sometime soon. Draw near to Him and say, God, please have Jesus take my sins away from me. Let me receive this washing, this cleansing, and this renew removal so I can draw near to you. He is happy to do it. And Christian, this is how we still draw near. This is a call for us not to keep our distance. This book is written to Christians who are wavering on these things, and this exhortation in verse 22 is for Christians to draw near, not just to become Christians, but to keep drawing near to the Lord. Don't keep your distance from Him. Keep coming near through the blood of Jesus, taking refuge in His work. So regularly, each day, throughout the day, take time to draw near through faith, through prayer, with your heart, to God Himself. Don't keep your distance. Second, hold fast. Verse 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for He who promised is faithful. So don't weaken your grip on Jesus, Christian. Hold fast to Him. The context here of the Hebrews, these first readers, many of them were, uh, had a Jewish ethnic heritage and religious background, but they came to Christ, and the book of Hebrews is warning them about the temptation to go back, to leave Jesus. There's persecution. It doesn't seem like it's worth it. The culture doesn't like Christians. It's easier to just go back and be Jewish, do the Day of Atonement thing again, hold fast to all of those things. And the book of Hebrews is written to say, you can't do that. And we love our Jewish friends and we grieve for them these weeks. And we also recognize that the hope that any human has, whether ethnically Jewish or not, is only going to be found in Jesus. He's our eternal hope. And it will only be found in Jesus. Many Jewish people today still celebrate the Day of Atonement called Yom Kippur. But their temple was destroyed in 70 AD as a judgment 
for rejecting Jesus in part, and they no longer do sacrifices. They don't do the goats anymore because they don't have the temple to do them, and instead they pray, and they view prayer as a kind of replacement for the sacrifices. But prayer can't replace what the Day of Atonement was doing and foreshadowing. The point of the Day of Atonement is not that we have an invitation to pray, but that we need a sacrifice for our sins. Jesus alone is the sacrifice. Our prayers are heard when we come to the Father through Jesus because of His atoning sacrifice. So the first readers were tempted to go back to Judaism, and Hebrews is saying, even if you you could do those things, they won't work. Because if you reject Jesus, he was the point all along. And now that Jesus has come, those things are going away. And they don't work because they only work insofar as you're trusting the Lord for this coming Savior as well. So the author says you can't go back because Jesus is here. Stay with him. Hold fast to him. Jesus is the only way to the Father. There's not many ways to God because we need Jesus. We need atonement. And only Jesus can provide it. So hold fast to him. And then finally... Encourage one another. Verse 24, and let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So, what kind of people do we become if we have this kind of God who loves us this much and gives us this kind of Savior? Clearly, He wants us to embrace Jesus as our atoning sacrifice, if he's building history to foreshadow it and then bring Jesus. So what kind of people do we become? We become people who are so happy, so grateful to be restored to God that we can't help but love one another, do good works, stir each other up to love and good works, and meet to encourage one another. And we don't do this to earn God's favor or to try to show that we're worthy to get back into His presence. We do it because we're already in His presence. He's received us. He's adopted us. He's cleansed us. He's forgiven us. There's nothing left for us to do. And so, because of that, we actually become the kind of people that want to serve and bless the Lord and want Him to be our true treasure above all things. And we want to encourage each other. So, that's the final encouragement here in the book of Hebrews in light of all this stuff, is don't go out on your your own. Keep meeting together as believers. Keep encouraging one another with these things because there's a day drawing near. Not a day of atonement, but the day of judgment and the day of the renewal of all things and the day when God will be with his people again. All will be made new. All will be clean and will be with him forever. And the life we lost in Eden is going to be restored, but better. Let's pray. Father, we praise you and worship you and honor you for this work of atonement that you provided through Jesus. And so right now in our hearts, we draw near to you. And if anyone here is struggling to draw near to you or uncertain or timid, we pray that you would move them to draw near through Jesus. We thank you for the atoning sacrifice, the cleansing work, the judgment and banishment taken for us. And so we pray that you'd fill our hearts even as we sing this next song with great joy. In Jesus' name, amen.